This is His Word Unveiled. Thanks so much for joining me today. We're hitting one chapter in the book of Luke. This journey, this this walking through this His Word Unveiled, walking through the entire Word of God, reading through in that chronological plan, and Father being so clear with me personally. I don't know how you're making this work or how you're, you know, how long you're taking and the process, no matter how long it is, is beautiful. And as we are exposing ourselves to his truth, as we're diving in, God is moving. It's incredible. For me personally, he has been very clear with, you will not miss a single day. Every day, at least one video will be posted. And I knew that that was within me. That's what father was calling me to do. I don't understand the timing. I don't get it. I know that there are probably, there's probably not even one person um, walking this out with me in the extent of, of, um, of every single day and the amount of videos. And so it's easy for me to say, Father, why, why do I need to do this every day? Can I not have a break? Can I not just like, just chill my mind out for a bit? And I know Father's been speaking every single day. And I'm telling you what, that's what's getting me the most. That's what's making this come alive in me the most is every single day. That it's so fresh, that it's so real, that it's one after another. So easy to piece together, to connect, to to just flip back and be like, hey, I just read this here. This connects in this way, how this was spoken it's just a whole other, it's a game changer for me. I'm so grateful, no matter how difficult this has been, I'm so grateful that Father did not let me, you know, have a break here or there. It's, it's every single day, and I am learning the power, the beauty of this daily pursuit. He is really giving me a new perspective on what a daily pursuit is looks like and what it really does and what it releases within us and around us. It is truly out of this world, a supernatural, divine, miraculous thing that I just, I'm so humbled to experience and to be able to just, to just obey, to hear God speak and walk this out with him. So this is so, so precious. He is so precious. So whatever your um, journey looks like in these videos, um, just stick with it. Whatever Father is speaking to you spe specifically to do personally in your heart, do it. Be obedient. Press through it no matter how hard it gets, no matter how challenging it is, no matter how tired you are. What the Lord is speaking to you to do through this and, and, and His timing and what that's to look like and what you are to sacrifice to do this and what and when and how, just listen. Listen to the voice of the Lord and be obedient and trust Him that he, he is into the very best for you. It is to your benefit. He is fighting for you. He sees where you're at. He knows what you want. He knows what's best for you. And he's going to call you into something that won't break you, but it will develop you and it will strengthen you and it will empower you and it will do something and mean something and be something so, so good. Okay. With that, um, I'm excited for today. Let's jump into our reading. Luke chapter 10 is what we are hitting. So hit that pause button, read through chapter 10 of the book of Luke, and let's see what God has for us today. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Father, we are so humbled to be used by you, for you to even just desire to speak to us and to call us out. Just into the middle of it, into the middle of just your work and your power and your glory. Father, you send us out, but in that sending out, you are drawing us in. Lord, thank you for just working in miraculous ways every single day. You are a God of miracles. Father, help us to open our eyes and to see those miracles, to see your hand at work, to see what you're doing and, and how we can apply it to our own lives and seeing that in everything you do, you do for us, you fight for us. It's for us. Lord, your heart just screams loving us, screams just drawing us into what matters, to life, to salvation. Father, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for taking care of us and loving us and, and leading us on by sending us out and drawing us in. Thank you, Lord. Be with us today. Um, 
we just pray that you be our insight and you be our understanding. You be our revelation today. We love you, Father. We love you. We thank you. We thank you for life. We thank you for your heart and your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 10. Let's get to this. Okay, the first verse. Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So Jesus sends out 70 others, it says. Now, Jesus has 12 disciples of his own that they were chosen, that they are, we, we always hear about the 12, the, you know, the 12 that follow Jesus, his disciples that we saw specifically how Jesus called them out and to himself, but we see here that the Lord appoints 70 others, that there were more believing in Jesus. There were more following after him. He had more disciples, not of the 12, but even more. And it says that Jesus sent out 70 others, sending them to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Verse two, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful that there are plenty of people who want to know Jesus, who want to hear the truth, who are eager to be close to him, to know him personally, to understand this truth, to understand and be familiar with the words spoken by the Lord. The harvest is plentiful. There's, there's plenty out there. There's plenty of people to go to. There's plenty of, of, of stories and, and lives, souls to speak life into. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So they were sent out to preach, to be among the people, to share the love of Jesus to them. They were sent out to do that and also to invite others to join them as they pray for more laborers, that they were to be praying in their ministry as they were out, as they were sent out, they were to be beseeching the Lord, seeking the Lord, praying to him, asking for more laborers. So as they were, were out doing stuff for the Lord, they were still connected with God, seeing the need that, hey, this harvest, it's plentiful. There are, there are so many people in need, eagerly wanting more of the Lord, wanting to be opened to the truth. In that and in their meeting, those needs being sent out with the power and authority of Jesus, they were praying to the Lord, asking for more laborers, for more people to be sent out. This is a, hey, let's share Jesus' love, but not just share it and move on. Let's share it. And in that sharing, let's see God's work in training these people. Again, inviting them to join them as laborers, as they're praying for these people that, that are going to be awakened to truth, to be developed, to be trained so that more and more laborers can go out into this plentiful harvest. Beautiful. And that's how God works. That God wants us out there speaking, yes, but also training so that there's more. It can't just be us. It wasn't intended to be our weight and our burden. God calls us out, wanting us to be connected in prayer so that we are seeking God out, understanding that He will provide labors. It is His words that will reach the people. He will be the one speaking and moving and awakening and bringing into salvation. He does the saving. He does the training. We've got to be in obedience. We have got to go when he sends us out. We've got to be obedient and willing to follow after him when he leads us on, believing that he's got it. He's going to provide the labors. We just got to be seeking the Lord for him to do so. Show him that we mean business, that we, we recognize that this is his work, his doing. It's going to be for his glory. It's his training. It's all in him not in us. And we see later on in this chapter just how simple these 70 um these 70 ones that were appointed and sent out. It's the simple that God is sending out. He's not looking for ones who are so, you know, has has all this education and all this experience. Oh, he sends them out and he uses them absolutely for sure. But he wants even in that, even in those degrees, even in that experience, even in all of all of that um, that's kind of lifted them maybe at a higher level, just screaming this heart condition where it's got to be a simple thing. It's got to be that we are not sent out because of. We see that we are not qualified because of our degree, because of our experience. We're qualified because God sends us out. 
So he wants it simple. He wants us keeping low. He wants us keeping humble and just following after the Lord that it's simple where we go out and we speak what we know, our own encounters, our own intimacy, this this relationship, how real it is because we've tasted, we've seen, we've lived it out. Keeping in that, that's where power is when we are sent out because our hearts are just wanting to obey the Lord, are just wanting to love Him. Verse three, go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So He is sending them out to the people as lambs, sent out among so many wolves, so many who will come in, so many who will reject, so many who will will, will attack, so many who are up to no good, who will, who will come against what we speak. Those lies will come against. That's what the enemy is after. And the Lord says, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Then he goes into what we read in Matthew 10 and Mark 6, talking about don't bring anything with you, carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Talking about bringing peace into these homes, just based off of hospitality and who will accept them in. And if they accept them, just the peace there, the blessing that they are instructed to just leave there, to speak even into them, bring about encouragement. If they um, if they reject them, if they are not helping, if they are not willing to bring them in, Jesus then lays that out, says, don't worry, you're going to shake the dust off of your feet, move on, but speaking a judgment against them. That all who reject, all who say no, all who refuse to help, there will be judgment against them. And this takes us into, as we read still in those same chapters, about um, <clears throat> Sodom and Gomorrah and Chorazin and Capernaum and all of these cities where where um, they mentioned it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and for Sodom in that day than those who reject, than those who, who reject these words that they bring, who say, no, we don't want to help, we don't want any part of this. It will be more tolerable for those wicked cities than for those who simply reject, who just say, nope, I don't have time. I don't want to hear it. Um, and Jesus laying out this understanding, this reasoning. And again, we read this in Matthew 10, Mark 6, those chapters. I'm hearing it again in Luke. But this understanding that if these miracles, if Jesus walking, talking among them at that time when they were full of wickedness and this judgment even came upon them and speaking, it's going to be more tolerable for them. Because if these miracles happened... If, if Jesus was there at that time, they would have repented. But Jesus brings up the fact that they're not repenting. They're not receiving this. And in lack of repentance, that throws you at a level that's deeper in wickedness than, than these cities who were known for their wickedness, their violence, their all of these, these um, sins that they were just involved in and consumed with. Jesus laying that out, it will be more tolerable for these wicked cities than, than for you now not wanting to repent, not wanting to respond to the Holy Spirit, not wanting to listen and to obey these words, that Jesus is here in person speaking and in them being fulfilled. And these people walking around talking about, it's here, it's now, it's happening. Repent, come to know the Lord. And they're not repenting. Let's jump down to verse 17. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Just expressing the power in this, that when we are sent out, when we go out into the world as the salt of the earth and the light of the world, as God sends us out, qualifying us to just be real to just keep it simple, to just tell others how loved they are and to invite them in to have a relationship with a God who loves them so deeply, keeping it simple. And Jesus expresses to them, says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. That it's this, he's falling. His, his power, his what he had, this grip on people, it's falling. These chains are breaking because of the power and the authority of the Lord. And they're being sent out and just speaking and just living and just being, just being real and sharing the love of Jesus. There's power in that. Verse 19, behold, I have given you authority. So again, he's speaking to these 70 who were sent out. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power, all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Verse 20, this is good. Nevertheless, so Jesus just speaks, I've given you all this power. 
I've given you all this authority over all the power of the enemy. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. This is so, this is so beautiful. This is so powerful. Jesus is saying it is not about the things you are able to do with the power given to you. It's not about what you're doing with this authority and power. It's not that these demons with this power of darkness are subject to you. Don't rejoice over those things. Now, you can be glad and you can be grateful and you can praise God and he is glorified through it. But don't get hung up on rejoicing in those things. That will, that will, just, that will just lift us up. We, it cannot be about the things that we are able to do with the power given to us. It's about the power of salvation that has our names written down, saving us a place in heaven. Jesus says, you've got to be more concerned with what I've done for you, with what this is doing for you, how this is saving you a place in heaven. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in me coming down from heaven here to earth as your salvation. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that relationship. Rejoice in the fact that I have given you all you need. Not necessarily in this power and in, in um, causing you to be capable to, to overpower and, and have the powers over these demons. That they are subject to you. Don't rejoice over things you do. Rejoice over the things I have done for you and in you and an eternity, the fact that you have a place in eternity. We can rejoice in the Lord and our promised re eternity with him. And Jesus does the rejoicing over what he has accomplished through us. And we see this in verse 21. So he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Rejoice that you are saved. Rejoice that, that you will be living with me in eternity as you are connecting with me, as you have believed in me. Rejoice in that. He says, don't rejoice over the things you're doing, over the powers of darkness. Then he says in verse 21, at that very time, he rejoiced. Jesus rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. So with spirit, with you, he is rejoicing deeply, strongly in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. So Jesus is rejoicing. This word, he rejoiced, rejoiced means to jump for joy with exceeding joy. This is how our Savior, a holy God, is rejoicing. He is jumping for joy with exceeding joy joy. And he rejoices. It says greatly in the Holy Spirit saying, you have hidden these things, speaking to his father. You've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, have revealed them to infants. He's revealed them to the simple that he's not hung up on. Oh, you've done so much. So I'm going to give you this power. No, he says, you've loved me so much. You have sought after me so hard that I'm giving you this power, that you are now making yourself ready and available and willing to go out and penetrate the power of the darkness and bring about light. That's what Jesus is saying, the simple I am using, the simple where they're not so hung up on the things that they know, the things that they've seen, the things that they can do. No, keeping it simple, keeping it low, keeping them humble with this childlike faith, depending on the Lord, trusting on the Lord, those simple things, it's been revealed. Those simple, those simple ones, this revelation has been given where they're not getting hung up on in rejoicing and the things that they are doing and they are seeing come to light. They're seeing accomplished. They're not getting hung up on, look what I've done and look who I'm helping and look how I'm serving and look, look the miracles did through me and, and through me going to them and laying hands on them and they're not getting hung up. The simple, the simple are just going to keep seeing God and recognizing that it's all in God. He tells us, rejoice, rejoice in me and what I have done and bringing this salvation. You focus on rejoicing in that. And Jesus says, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice over what he has accomplished through us, over what my father has accomplished in you and through me to you. It's he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing in the things that are done, the deeds of light and righteousness. 
He's rejoicing in the accomplishment, in the victory, in the freedom that we have. We can't get hung up on those things. We have got to rejoice in simply knowing God and knowing that eternity is waiting for us, that there's a place for us in eternity because God loves us, because he has chosen us, because he has given us full access into him. That's what we need to be focused on. That's how we can rejoice, not the things we see coming out of what we're doing, but understanding that this is God moving and working. So we are rejoicing in him and in him alone. So beautiful. As we rejoice in him and knowing God, he rejoices over what comes out of that. The power that comes out of that kind of humility, that kind of lowliness, that kind of seeking and desperation and just being hungry and thirsty for so much more of the Lord. As we keep it simple and just love him, that more is done. That more just naturally flows from us and things are happening. Things are happening and souls are being saved. And again, we can't rejoice in the things that we do. We're not doing the saving. There's nothing in us that's causing any of this to happen. We're rejoicing in the Lord as he rejoices over the things that he accomplishes through us. So beautiful. Those two verses, those two verses, oh my goodness, we've just got to be we, we've just got to be in that, you know, just not rejoicing over what we have done, but over what he has done, over who he is. Those verses, like, yes, yes, yes. Okay, let's go down to verse 23. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. Then he continues in 24 saying many prophets and kings wish to see the things that you see, wish to hear the things that you hear. We saw that same verse same message um, in Matthew chapter 13, the same thing that, that blessed are your eyes. Blessed are the things that you're choosing to see. Blessed are the way that you're opening your eyes to see more, to see that there's always more. It's never just this or just that. There's so much more, more meaning, more depth, seeing with spiritual eyes and not just, you know, through, through our human eyes and what's set before us. There's always more. And Jesus said, blessed are your eyes and seeing, and truly seeing, and truly hearing, and going deeper, and taking it deeper, and making a connection in everything, seeing God's hand in it all. Verse 25, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? So Jesus just comes back, knows, knows exactly what he's up to, knows that he's trying to to have grounds to accuse him, to test him in what he's going to say and try to prove him wrong. He simply asks, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what's written in the law? You know the law. You, you know it well. You're a great teacher. So what does it read to you? And verse 27, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So love your neighbor as yourself. So he knows the law and he's reading the law and that's where it's at. Inheriting eternal life, that's what it comes down to. You shall love the Lord your God. Yes, that simple. I love the message of just keeping it simple. Jesus is not into sending all those who are qualified according to the world's standards. According to his standards, it's right here to love the Lord your God. Who is loving God with all of their heart, with everything? that their heart is not treasuring or finding anything more important than God himself, than knowing God, than being close to him. Loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind, and we're loving our neighbor as ourself. That, that is what one must do to inherit eternal life. Just that, in its simplest form, to love God, to love God purely, wholeheartedly. Verse 28, and he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. That's it. That brings life. You will live if you do those things. Now, it's easy to say, yeah, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, all of that. But do we? Break that out. Like, I encourage you to sit on that verse and really say, okay, how well am I doing? Am I loving God with all of my strength, with all of my energy, with all of my even lack of sleep, with all of my, my, my lack of health, good health? Are, with all of our strength, are we loving God? Are we seeking after him? Are we praying fervently? Are we going hard after him? Are we just saying, mm, don't really feel like it today? Or I've got this to do, like all of our strength. What about all of our mind? 
Are we loving God with all of our mind? What are the thoughts that we are thinking? Again, and I've said this in a few videos, but if someone could read our thoughts, could read our minds, would they know who God is? What are we thinking about the most? What are we dwelling on? What are we rehearsing? Those things will be able to tell. Th those things, anyone, if someone could read our mind, they would know who we serve. They would know what and who was most important to us. Really break that apart, just in a personal way, kind of break that up and what does this look like? How am I doing? Where am I at with the Lord? So good, that's, so, that's such a good thing to do, to really personalize this and that's what brings about personal application. So the Lord says, do this and you will live. Verse 29, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus goes into this story that many of us are familiar with about the good Samaritan. So it says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. They stripped him, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead alongside the road. Then it says, by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, completely avoiding him. This is a priest in a position to be over, to be taking care of, to be speaking life, to be all of these priestly duties that he was to do. Um, but getting so caught up in his time and the things that he was doing and how important he was in that position where it set him, that it said he saw him, this man who was who was bruised and bloody and stripped down, had nothing, laying alongside of the road, half dead. And this priest, in the position that he was in, thought that he needed to avoid him completely, walked on the complete other side of the road and continued on his business like nothing ever happened. Then he says in verse 32, likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, a priest and a Levite, Jesus used these these two positions, these two men very strategically, that these were very prominent men. These were very high positioned men, very well known men. They were looked at, they were admired by all the things they they knew, all the things they, they could do, all the ways they had access into the temple, working in the very important, very holy things. These men Jesus used in speaking um, how then you know, they can be in that position, but that means nothing when it comes to the simplicity of loving God and loving your neighbor. This one thing that Jesus answered, well, actually the man himself answered in saying, or answering his own question in how does he inherit eternal life? So verse 32, the Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. That it's 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 below him. It's it's below him. He doesn't have time for something like a half dead man who's bruised and bloody, can't take care of him, can't you know, he's too busy, he's got too, you know, important things to do and, and people to reach and people to see and, and things to do in the temple and and moving on. The the opposite side of the road. So maybe it makes him feel better that he's not walking too closely to him and walking by. Ignoring, avoiding, um, not stopping. Then verse 33, but a Samaritan, love Samaritan, that this is a Samaritan, one who is hated, one who, who wants nothing to do with, with this man, this man who is stripped and robbed and, and beaten, this Samaritan and this man who is robbed and beaten, there's no connection. There's, there's this understanding between the two that they're, they're just supposed to stay apart. There's the, a Samaritan is looked down upon by this man. There was no reason why this Samaritan needed to or should have stopped in any sense of the matter. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him and when he saw him, he felt compassion right then and there, right there feeling compassion that this Samaritan, no matter who was laying alongside of the road, no matter who the Samaritan was, what position he had in life, he felt compassion. That right there is a response to the Holy Spirit because he is a compassionate God. And when we allow ourselves to feel that no matter who it is, you know, someone that another, another race, an, an enemy, and no matter who it is, when we feel compassion, when we allow the Holy Spirit to allow us to feel compassion. Now, I say Holy Spirit, but at this time, the Samaritan, the Holy Spirit was not given. But for us now, in that personal application, we've got to respond. And when we feel compassion, we've got to move on that. We've got to walk towards that. And it wasn't just that he felt compassion and then, oh, I wish I could stay, but just move on. No, he did something about it. 
he responded to the Holy Spirit and allowing himself to feel, and he responded even more by taking action. It says he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. So his things, his belongings, his money, what he worked for, what he has bought, what he owned, he used to help this man. And he put him on his own beast, so lifted him up, set him on the beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Now again, this denarii, this um, translates to the denarius was equivalent to a day's wages. So this was two days wages for this Samaritan. Two days of hard work. Two days, full days of work that he spent on this complete stranger. That a priest and a Levite, having many things, having many, much money, having all of this, whatever, in their position. And they just move on. And here's this man using his uh, two full wages of, of working um, of working days, spends on this stranger, and he says, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will return and I will pay you. He doesn't know this man from Adam. Like, doesn't know him, doesn't care. He felt compassion, he saw a need, and he responded. It doesn't matter if he didn't know him. He said, look, here, do whatever it takes to get this man on his feet, to get this man healed, to, to have him taken care of. I will pay whatever it is. Doesn't even know him. And then Jesus lays it out to this lawyer who's trying to stop him up and says in verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. He's saying, do the same. Keep your eyes open to the need. I speak that to my children every time I drop them off for school. Keep your eyes open to the need. Don't see a need and avoid. Don't feel embarrassed and just let that awkward feeling and just, you know, they're fine. Someone else will help or they'll, they'll be okay. No, you see the need and you respond. Don't just feel compassion. Don't just feel this, oh, I wish I could do something. You can do something. Go to them. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and help you. He's the one who provides. He's the one who works. He's the one who saves. He's the one who heals. Just be obedient and listen to the Lord. And if he's sending you out, then go. Then go. God can use you exactly where you're at with what you have, with what you've been given, with who you are, with the season of life that you're in. He can use you. But we have got to choose to see. We've got to want to see. We want the Lord to say, blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. We have got to want to see more, want to see deeper. There's got to be something within us that desires more than what this world can give us. There's so much more. Verse 38, and we'll finish with this short story. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So she is like going into hospitality mode. Jesus himself is coming into her house. So she's probably freaking out like, oh my word, I wonder if the bathrooms are clean. I wonder if this is washed up. I wonder if I have dishes in the sink. I got to go. I got to make it presentable. I got to be hospitable. Let's make him a meal. Let's let him feel comfortable. I wonder what kind of lighting. I wonder if he's cold or hot. Martha's in this hospitality mode right away. Verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. I tell you what, that's the position that I choose to be in for the rest of my life. And just at the feet of Jesus, my heart is to sit at the feet of Jesus every day for the rest of my life, listening to his every word. That's where I want to be, seated at the feet of my Lord, just listening, just learning, just gleaning from him. So she had a sister, Martha. This is her home. This is, I mean, she's she's invited him in. This is her home. She, she's about to, to bust out her hospitality best. And it says her sister Mary was seated at the Lord's feet, not not budging, not moving, probably eyes so fixed on his, listening to his word. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with all of her preparations. So um, that translates to much service, the way that she wanted to serve Jesus. Again, having everything prepared, everything for him to be comfortable. She wanted to serve him. She wanted to give to him. She wanted him to feel comfortable and blessed. 
So it says Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. The Lord says, look, this isn't about you serving and you having everything prepared perfectly and everything cleaned up and everything ready to go and and you bringing me things. He says, I want you to focus on the things that matter, on the things that's necessary, the best thing, the only thing that should be taken care of, and that's you and your heart. Jesus is saying, I don't need you to do all these things for me. I just want this love I just want this connection. I just want your heart. I just want you sitting at my feet, connecting with me, letting me love on you, letting me teach you, letting me speak to you, letting me assure you and comfort you and protect you. Jesus is not concerned over the things that we do. He says, I want you tapping into who you are and you are mine and you are loved. That is who you are, so sit at my feet. Jesus welcomes us to sit at his feet because here's the beautiful thing. When we sit there and when we lay our head back up against his chest and we just, we're just with him, then when he gets up and moves, then we are naturally just connected to him and we are moving with him. He will see that accomplishment happens. He will see that service takes place. He will see that, that it will come. It will be fulfilled. It will be established. It will be given. It will, it will happen. Things will work out. Things will be fine. But our fight, our focus, what we, what we need to be in, how he says, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part. One thing is necessary, and that is just being with him, being in his presence. There are a lot of people who are out serving and doing so many wonderful things, beautiful things, good things that are changing lives. There are so many people out there, but let me tell you, it is possible to be out there doing so many wonderful things, to be a light. To, there, there, it is possible to be out there serving, ministry after ministry, doing all of these things. It's possible to do that and to not be truly connected to the Lord, to not know Him, to not have this intimate relationship happening and, and connected and solid and firm. And without that connection, then we're just running around doing a bunch of things that make us feel good. But I want more than just feeling good. I want to be good and I want to be at His feet. I want real things to happen and nothing real will ever take place outside of the presence of the Lord. We've got to find ourselves there connected to him in his word, just catching ourselves singing to him, dancing with him, thinking about him, just just talking to him, inviting him in, letting him know where we're at, where our heart is, what we desire from him. It's those moments where we just sit and we think and we dwell on him and we rehearse his truth and we get into his truth and we stop and we worship and we praise and, and we declare his goodness and we're aware of his presence. It's those things. If those things are not happening and those things happen when no one else is around, what are we doing when we have all of that time? When, when we have you know time to spare when no, when no one else sees? When we have all, when, when we have that extra time, what are we doing? How are we spending it? What are, what are we craving? What are we longing for? What we, what can't we wait to do? It's, we've got to connect with him. We've got to sit at his feet. We've got to be intentional about those, those date nights with the Lord. Those times where we are still, those times where we get away and we do read and pray and, and, and just focus on the, the thing that's necessary, as he says, the thing that matters. That connection has to be with Jesus first before anything else. Before we start running out and talking about the Lord, before we run out and start getting in all these ministries and these Bible studies, there's got to be a connection with you and the Lord first. You make that connection. And then those Bible studies, those areas of ministry, church on Sunday, the worship team, like those things then those things, there's something, there's, there's, there's something deeper in those things when that connection with the Lord happens first. It's got to be, so let's find ourselves sitting at the feet of Jesus before we're like, oh, we got to do so much. We've got to, our life's got to look like this. If we're a Christian, we should be doing this. No, 
if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of the Lord, to inherit eternal life, what you've got to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That simple. Not easy, but it's that simple. That's what we got to do. That's our fight. That's how we seek. That's our pursuit. That's it right there. That connection with the Lord, seeing him, knowing him, and going deeper and deeper with him. Whew. Okay. That's it. Thanks so much for walking this out with me. Love this growth. Love this journey. Love who God is. Love his word. Oh, I just want more. So we're going to continue going after more. Thanks so much for walking this out with me. I'll see you soon on my next video.